Good evening, everyone. Good to see everybody out tonight. Just want to um, echo the thank yous from all the men who have stood up here for this opportunity we've had to bring lessons from God's Word. Appreciate their, their time, their example, and their knowledge. Thank you all for being here for when you could, uh, when you could show up to any of these, these meetings. We've had a, had a great a great week. We want to thank those who are listening at a later date, either on a social media or on a, on a podcast. And we would love to ex- extend an invitation to you to come be with us if you're ever in the Somerset, Kentucky area. And I know that coming to a place where you don't know anybody would be a daunting task if you've never been here before, so I'll try to help you with that. My name is Brad Harris. I get to be married to Jessica Harris. We have three kids. We've been blessed with three kids. I'm not overly fond of cold weather, and I love food. So there's some things that we can have a commonality about. So if you're ever here, look for me. We'll get to know each other, and I promise you, before you leave services, you will know many, many more people. We've been cruising along at a a really awesome altitude all week. Brian got us started Sunday morning taking us off, and we, we've been cruising with Michael and Shane and, and Sam and, and Jonathan last night. The plane's got to come down sometime, right? We've got to bring the plane in, so if not me, then who? Tonight, we're going to uh, accomplish, try to accomplish three, three tasks, three objectives. The primary objective is to give God all the glory and honor in the things that we say, our songs, things that we're teaching, especially I want to make sure that everything's right coming from His Word. We want to make sure everything's true. The secondary objective is to look the characteristic of light as it relates to us and how we identify as being a light for Christ. Maybe do some self-reflection along the way. The tertiary objective is to lay some groundwork for another very talented group of people who are going to be speaking in August. If you're here, one of those speakers in the audience tonight, I'm going to go ahead and apologize if I use anything that you might use for this topic as walking a center of light, which is what we're speaking about in August. I will say that time is on your side as it relates to me. Half a trip around the sun, I tend to forget what people say, much less what I say. So, but we look forward to to that that meeting coming up. Jesus spoke these words in in John chapter 8, verse 12. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Our Savior was was really, really good at relating to people on so many levels, whether it be through occupations or events, traditions. He had a way of bringing a visual component to his his teaching. In order to set this this lesson up, I want to try to do that tonight. But before we get to John 8, 12, I think we need to go back to John 7. In John chapter 7, verse 2, you can see that we are at the feast of the booths. I told Michael last night, I've never considered going back to a moment in time just for the smell of it. But it's a feast. I like food. I understand. That, that would be intriguing. But uh, for our purposes tonight, we're going to stick with the visual component of going back to a moment in time. So we're at the Feast of Booths. <clears throat> what we know about these, these booths is they were, th- these feasts, they were, uh, or they were appointed by God. To, to keep. Jonathan talked about it last night, about the Ethiopian eunuch would go to, to these, these feasts, along with others. These were appointed by God, and all the native Israels are supposed to go there and dwell in these booths. We don't see a whole lot about the construction of these booths, but in, in Jewish history, there's, there's information about basically what these booths are supposed to, supposed to allow is sunlight and starlight, and you're supposed to be able to see out the top of those, those things from the information I have, which is a very interesting point to me. Back to John 7, <clears throat> to kind of sum this up, the Feast of Booths is going on. They were all going to go. Christ said, I'm not going to go because it's, I'm paraphrasing. It's not my time yet, but you all go. But he ended up going to the Feast of Booths in private, and as he would do when he, go, when he would go anywhere, he began teaching. Well, this started an uproar. The Pharisees asked the officers to arrest him. When we get to verse 37 in, in John chapter 7, and Christ says, 
It's on, the, it's on the last day, the last day of the feast, the great day. He stood up, he said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. There's a whole lot of information, a whole lot of stuff there we could talk about, but for the sake of time, we're going to, we're going to move on. This caused a division. Is this, is this the prophet? Is this the Christ? Is he from Galilee? Didn't the scripture say he's going to come from Bethlehem, where David was from? There's some issues with the, with the, the officers that didn't arrest Jesus. They came to the Pharisees and said, why didn't you arrest him? Well, we never heard anybody talk like this before. Nicodemus got involved. He, said, he needs a fair trial. Paraphrasing. It's up that all these people go back to their own house in, in chapter 7, verse 53. But remember, we're in the Feast of Booths. There's thousands upon thousands of pilgrims who are here for this feast. So there's booths everywhere on top of rooftops, just everywhere, all kinds of people. Some specifics about the feast we can read about in Leviticus and other places too. The days, the offerings, how much work, what kind of work, etc. What we're going to talk about tonight, we don't really read about in Scripture. I want to be very clear about this. This is a Jewish tradition, what we're going to talk about. We don't, again, we don't read about it in, in, in Scripture. We read about it in Jewish history. It's no longer practice, along with a, another ceremony called the water ceremony. We don't want, I don't know when it started, but we can pretty well pinpoint about when it stopped at the destruction of the temple. It was called the illumination of the temple. And this was a nightly ceremony all seven days of the, uh, of the feast. There were four golden oil-fed lamps in the court of women, 75 feet in height. They were ignited with old priestly garments that were no longer fit to be worn. They would fill these, these bowls up with I read somewhere 10 gallons of oil, and they would, they would burn all night long. As a result of these, these huge candle labras, this is a stunning vision. It illuminated the entire city. Lots of Jewish historians say that it looked like a diamond in the midst of the city of Jerusalem, filling the whole temple area with light. Some excerpts from some Jewish, Jewish uh, history says there was not a courtyard in Jerusalem that was not illuminated from this light. The light was so bright that a woman could sift wheat by its illumination. This feast was a call to remember about what God had done for the, their ancestors in the wilderness. It was also a reminder about what was going to happen in the future. There, there was going to be a great light sent. Read about that in Isaiah chapter Isaiah 9 for the world, for the Jews and the Gentiles. And this was designed so that all generations may know about what had taken place and what was to come. And these pictures are not going to do it justice. You can see that the four candelabras there, you can see it kind of reflecting off the walls a little bit. We can see that there's a lot of light in this, this whole area. There's another view of what's going on here. I can't imagine, I imagine it being brighter just from the... Uh, from the descriptions that we have. But back to the text. We're in, we're in chapter 8 now. Jesus goes to the Mount of Olives, and he's up there, and early in the morning he comes down. The feast, feast is ending. And he gathers around all these people who have, who have been at this feast all night long and see this nightly ritual with lights. <clears throat> and the Pharisees bring this lady to him, um, a woman caught in adultery. And he squashes that issue pretty, pretty quickly. But then he starts teaching again, and everybody comes to him, and he says these words, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Again, so relatable in his teaching to what's going on at this time. I, I imagine this made a huge impact. You come here every year, you see these lights, and now this person is here teaching and saying, he is the light of the world. <clears throat> As we think about what Jesus is saying, following Jesus parallels this imagery of the wilderness when the Israelites followed God in the pillar of fire. Following Jesus is not just saying that we are followers of Jesus. Those who follow Jesus have the light of life to walk by. Jesus says that you will have the light of life, that you will possess the light. You will be in a relationship with that light. It means attaching yourself to Jesus, going where he goes, believing what he says, and doing believing what he teaches and doing what he says. This is one of the ways Christ identified himself to us. He is the light of the world. Other I am statements in the book of John. I am the bread. I am the way, truth, the light. 
In John 9, he says, as long as I am in the world, after he, before he heals a blind man, of, um, he's been born, born blind, he says, as long as I am in the, wor- in the world, I am the light of the world. <clears throat> We've discussed a lot of ways we identify in Christ this week. We're going to talk about another one that we're all extremely familiar with. We read about it in Matthew 5. <clears throat> Matthew 5, verse 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand and give light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to the Father who is in heaven. We're going to take this scene in John chapter 7 and chapter 8. We're going to refer back to this verse, kind of look at some similarities between the light at that time and the light we are supposed to have. <clears throat> if you think back to this scene, the seven days, sometimes you might have found yourself late to the, to the party, so to speak. But it would be very easy to you, for you to navigate your, your way through the temple area to get to the, where the source of the light is because of the light that these candelabras provided. We illuminate the correct path to Jesus. <clears throat> Many times Jesus would say these words, follow me, follow me. In saying that, he never guaranteed the path was going to be easy. He never said that there would be difficulties and struggles and temptations and heartbreaks. But this was the path, the correct path that would lead us to, to life. We don't have Christ here today. We don't have him here with skin on, to coin a phrase from a Brian McDonald um, sermon some time ago. But we have his word. Psalm 119, 105, which Michael uh, led us in just a few moments ago, and all those songs were awesome, and and we're going to sing more as it relates to light. This is actually our our verse for February. Right, Cal? This is our theme for February, 105, 119, 105, Psalm 119, 105. So we're probably hearing this verse again. We're probably singing that song again. Matter of fact, I hope we do. We should sing it once, once a Sunday or maybe twice a Sunday, you know, whatever. It would be a good reminder for us. What we see in Jesus calling himself a light of the world as it relates to Psalm 119, 105, and David declaring that God's word is a lamp and a light tells us that light is supposed to shine in the darkness so that people can see their way, see, to, see the way to their lives, to live their lives. The light is to shine so that they can have direction because the world is full of darkness, John 1, 4 through 9. Light shows the way. Light illuminates the path. Light provides direction needed. Keep this in mind as we think about being the light of the world. We are to show the way. We are to give direction to the world. We are to illuminate the path. These words, the words that God has given us as our guide, we know the correct path if we read them, but reading them is just the start. Some action needs to be taken. God, God's word lights our path. We must walk in it. We are lights of the world. That's the calling we have. And in this task, there's so many people that we represent. We represent everyone who's ever followed God throughout history. We represent our creator. We represent his son. We represent Southside. We represent the eldership here and the leadership they provide. We represent our kids, the future. There's so many people we represent by walking the right path. And if we aren't walking this, this tiny, tiny path, if you've been to a Chick-fil-A study on Thursday mornings, you know we've talked about this is a razor-sharp, thin path. <clears throat> if I don't stay on it, how can I show others to walk it? You illuminate the correct path. You reflect the sun. There's a bunch of science people in here, so I hope I get this this right. The reason we see the moon shine at night is because the surface of the moon reflects the light of the sun. And as bright as it shines, it only reflects somewhere between 3 to 12 percent of the sunlight. Does that sound about right? Get some head shakes, get some maybes. So <laughs> if, if I mess that up, there's some people over there and over here that you can, uh, you can seek professional counsel. <laughs> if we think back to the Feast of Booths, these candelabras are burning at their peak. There was, there was a lot of 
There was not a courtyard that was not illuminated by this light. We see some reflection taking place on these walls. And when we think of, of reflections, what do we think of? We think of mirrors. Well, there wouldn't have been mirrors here as we know them today. However, we do have references of mirrors in, in, in several places in the Old Testament. We have them in, in Job, Job 3, Exodus 38, and Isaiah 3. There also would have been metals there that had reflective properties. You know, there's bronze there, probably gold. It would have reflected some light. And we know there, were, there was lots of things because the seas, there were things that were, that were stolen that had reflective properties. The light reflected from these candelabras, from those metal things, would have not have been very significant. But it would have been there. It would have still been present. Matthew 14 says a city set on Matthew 5, 14 says a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. A reflection, just like the, the sun, the moon reflects the sun. Not the full power of the sun, but a portion of it. We are a reflection of the char- characteristics of the sun. When Paul was writing this, this letter to the brethren in Colossae, I chose this place to, to find these characters, some of these characteristics. We can find many places where these are, these are listed. But this heading says, putting on the new self, that it's always being renewed from the knowledge, knowledge of the Creator. Colossians 3, 12 through 14 says, put on the new self of God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another one, forgive each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Remember who you are, as Michael led us in the song just a, a few moments ago. Some of you are familiar with Jim Hardy. I know the Blevins is a very, Blevins family is very, very familiar with Jim Hardy. He came here in, once in 16 and once in 18 and did some, did some, did some lessons. <clears throat> I remember a point in, the, in one of those lessons where he, he said this to his, his two boys. You got two boys? His two boys. I don't know if this is every week or, or every day or when he could, when he was around them, but he, he would say, boys, remember who you are. Remember who you are before they left in the morning. And that's, that's a fantastic thing that I should tell my kids every morning. But I wonder how beneficial it would be for me. Our mirror in our bathroom is pretty close to our, I mean, you, I see way more of myself in the morning, my face in the morning than I want to. But I wonder if, if, if in the mornings when I'm brushing my teeth and I'm trying to get, get awake, if I should just stare at myself and say, dude, remember who you are. You're a reflection of the Savior, a reflection of his, his kindness, his humility, his meekness, his patience, his forgiveness, his love. And then I should probably ask myself, remember our secondary objective is some self-reflection. How am I doing? <clears throat> Honestly, how am I doing? Am I reflecting in Christ in my attitude, in my words, in my, my dealings with people at work, as a father, as a husband, as a friend? And if I'm not reflecting the light of the world, who are they seeing? Way too much of me, that's who. I brought this up in a, in a lesson some time ago, and, and it came up uh, a few weeks ago. I was talking to a, a relative of mine that works in a, a store up here. We were talking about the, uh, and Shane hit on it too the other night when he talked about uh, not enough pickles on a sandwich. It kind of brought, caught, <laughs> brought this to memory. <clears throat> but the Sunday lunch crowd has a terrible reputation. Terrible reputation. And, and I know it's a bad stereotype, and we're not the only ones who, who go and eat and, and go to restaurants or places that, to buy things to eat. But there's a, sometimes a, a, a bad attitude of getting defensive when we hear that. You know, well, I'm, I'm, I'm here because I'm trying to get better. And, and yes, that's true. I understand that. <clears throat> perhaps, perhaps the attitude to have when we hear those things is, is one of accountability, right? One of, of ownership of an extreme nature and love. Perhaps I need to do a better job of separating myself from the stereotype. And I find myself in those situations to focus more of reflecting Christ during that time frame. You reflect the sun. <clears throat> you bring light to the darkness. You may recall at the beginning of this that the some Jewish, uh, the Talmud said that this, this light was so bright that a woman could sift wheat from its light. 
I don't know how many of y'all have ever been involved in sifting wheat with your hands. You can see up here, this is a, these are pictures of heads of wheat. You can see the kernels or, and the, uh, the hulls or the, the, the chaff or chaff, depending on where you're from. <clears throat> Pretty easy to see right here it went ample light, isn't it? We take it down to negative 50 brightness. It's a little more complicated. Negative 75. Negative 80. <laughs> Can you tell the difference between the grain and the, and the, uh, and the hole? I know it's in the botany class, and the, but I, I, again, I tend to see things in pictures, and you're kind of on this journey with me, so sorry about that. But you'll notice that it's, it's easy to tell when, when light is present. Christ provided light for us, and he still provides that light today. Matthew 5, 16 says, that they may see your good works in the Lord the Father who is in heaven. Many don't have this light. Many don't know this knowledge of Christ. They, they live in darkness. <clears throat> we find that hard to believe because we've always been taught that about the light, about God. But there are many people who have not. We have the lights to guide us, to direct us, to teach us. There was a man named John who was sent before Christ to tell everyone about the light that was to come. Our responsibility after Christ is to walk after him. 1 John 1, 7 states, This is the message we have heard from him proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him when we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in light as he is the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. When Paul was writing to, the, to his brethren in Ephesus, he said, At one time you were in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And the way that manifests itself is, is found in what is good and true and right. You are, you bring light to the darkness. Our final point tonight is you are a beacon. As we go back to this feast, one final time this evening, this fire would have been a reminder back in the, when the Israelites were in, in the wilderness of what God had done for them. It was also a reminder of what was going to come, this great light in Isaiah 9. And I would, I would think that looking at these, these things happening would be a, give a sense of gratitude at this feast by looking at this light that's, that's in, in the sky or this illumination that's happening around the temple. And also a sense of hope of what was to come, the light that was going to come, which was there in front of them, but they just didn't know it. The song we're going to sing for invitation is called Let the Lower Lights Be Burning. The Michael's going to lead us in just a few moments. It's not one we sing very often. There, there was a member here who used to attend who would sing it from time to time. Most of us are familiar with, with Johnny Lunsford. Jackson, Izzy, and Hogan would know him as Uncle Johnny. Well, we all familiar with Johnny. If you're not familiar with Johnny, Johnny served in the United States Navy. So he would be easily, he would easily identify with this song. I imagine he would be on a ship and he could see the, the lights burning on the shore and it just it would, it would resonate with him. This song was penned by a man named, named Philip Bliss and it has a very chilling story behind it. If you'll allow me to read this, I think it'll be beneficial as it relates to us and our identity as lights. <clears throat> At one of D.L. Moody's meetings in America, he related the story of a shipwreck on a dark and tempestuous night, even when not a star was visible. It was growing dark. The waves of the vast Lake Erie, almost a little ocean in itself, hissed and curdled against the base of the inner lighthouse near Cleveland, Ohio. Another interesting layer there as it relates to Johnny. The lighthouse keeper's job wasn't always convenient. His job was to keep the great lighthouse inside the harbor lit and also to tend a light and light a line of smaller oil lanterns to guide ships into the channel towards the harbor. The inner harbor had created a, was created as a safe haven where ships could flee when the sudden and dangerous Lake Erie storms arose. Despite the great lighthouse beacon, 
A ship would be dashed to pieces on the rocks without the little last to lead them through the narrow rock line passage. You can imagine it would have, what it would have been like to get into the gathering of blackness and painstakingly trudge from light to light to light, filling and lighting each lantern. It was a thankless task. The lighthouse keeper had been on this job for several years and rarely had any ship needed to find the harbor at night. Why should he even bother? Maybe it was this discouraging thought or his health or an oversight, but whatever the reason, the lights were not lit that night. As the night deepened, a violent storm hurled itself upon Lake Erie that could toss great ships as if they were toys and smash them against the shorelines with terrifying, deadly menace. The storms on the huge lake are not to be trifled with. As the tempest grew into roaring mountains and turbulent waves and screaming winds, a desperate captain tensed beside the wheel of his ship. Nearby stood an old pilot, also straining with his eyes into the ominous blackness. Underneath, the ship heaved and creaked, and the wooden decks were slippery with water. The captain squinted into the darkness. Are you sure this is Cleveland? he asked the pilot. Quite sure, sir, replied the pilot. His hands clamped fast upon the wheel. But where are the lower lights? They're out. They've gone out, sir. Can you make it? We must, sir, or we will perish. There was nothing else that they could do. Desperately, the old pilot tried to find his way into the channel. Without the lights that should have been there, the pitiless sea fractured and pulverized the ship against the rocky shoreline. Many lives were lost that night, all because one man did not do his job. The hymn, the history of this hymn, a young man named Philip P. Bliss read with horror the headlines of the story and how one man's careless negligence could be so deadly. It was only when he heard D.L. Moody's use of it in a sermon that it struck Philip Bliss to the heart. Moody ended his stirring sermon with this, Brethren, the master will take care of the great lighthouse. Let us keep the lower lights burning. As Philip told a friend afterwards, when I heard D Mr. Moody's use of the illustration in the sermon that night, I cried out in my heart, Bliss, you are just as guilty as the man in the story. As a Christian, you are to be the one of the lower lights shining brightly so that some poor soul tossed about in the sea of life may find safety and everlasting life in the heaven that God has prepared. First verse of this song says, Brightly beams our Father's mercy from his lighthouse evermore. But to us, you and me, he gives the keeping of the lights along the shore. Matthew 5, 16, In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to the Father who is in heaven. Our lives are to be holy, pure, and faithful, to be seen and known everywhere, always, in every situation, whether it be at business or at home, in prosperity and adversity, let it be seen that we are real Christians. The last verse of this song reads like this. Trim your feeble lamp, my brother. Some poor soul, some poor sailor, tempest-tossed, trying now to make the harbor in the darkness, may be lost. Trim your lamp. In the days when light came from burning oil lamps and vessels at sea, needed crewmen to constantly care for these lamps. This involved trimming the wick on a con consistent, constant basis. Trimming the wick drew the oil up from the storage reservoir as opposed to burning the wick down. A, dull, a wick that was not consistently uh, taken care of would, would burn poorly and dimly and use up the wick instead of the oil. A light that is firmly, that is trimmed on a consistent basis would be clean and bright. Trimming our lamps requires a constant check to ensure that we are illuminating the correct path. That we are reflecting Christ in everything that we do. We are bringing the light to those who live in the darkness and we are being beacons to those to lead others to heaven. Any feeble light can give light. We may think that our, our lights are not effective, but the feeblest of light at midnight is of use. A little candle can throw his beam so far, so shines a good deed in a naughty world. Family, we're a light of the world. <clears throat> you are the light of the world. 
A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and good glory to the Father who is in heaven. Before we close, again, our tertiary objective was to remind everyone about this upcoming meeting in August, August 14th and 17th. I know we've got a meeting between there and a VBS and probably some other stuff. But it's important to encourage these men who are going to put lessons together for this, this meeting. And there's no doubt they will do a good job. And we, we look forward to that opportunity as, as the Lord allows. As we come to a close tonight and we come to the end of this meeting, <clears throat> I hope we've been renewed. I hope we've got a better better zeal about being lights, about identifying with Christ, and then we take that zeal and we use it. I mean, after all, what good is a light if it's hidden? It doesn't do any good. The invitation extended is extended to Christ tonight. If the darkness has overtaken your life and led you down the wrong path, and you need the prayers of getting back on the right path, we, we ask you to please come forward. If you've not been obedient to Christ and, and wish to do so tonight, we can help you. There is a whole lot of love in this room. A whole lot of love. Everyone here cares for your soul. And they desire that you go to heaven. But they cannot take the first step to obedience for you. That has to come from you. Now, if you don't want to walk along, Kyle's going to be standing up here as we, as we extend the invitation. He's 6'5", and he can see your hand. He will come to you and walk with you. I promise you. He will, he, he will find you. Everyone here in this building desires all of us get safe passage to heaven. If there's anything we can do for you tonight, we ask you to please come as we stand and as we sing.